Here's our entire interview with producer Mark Howard. He engineered first with Daniel Lanois and moved up to working with so many big artists. Bob Dylan, the Neville Brothers, Tragically Hip, Neil Young, Joni Mitchell. The list is long. We have our entire interview here. If you're listening to it on the podcast, you can get the video version. Just check the description and vice versa. Here's Mark Howard on Rock History Book. Moods guy. You create the mood around the house, around the room, around the town. You create it on record. I mean, it's like intrinsically, maybe when you were 19 and you, you know, started getting all, you know, you you got involved with Daniel Lanois. Maybe you didn't know that, but looking back now, are you surprised you were able to to it's to me, it's all these moods sonically and visually. And the book showed me that, by the way, great great pictures because I felt like a fly on the wall. And I know that you were probably trying to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It was all done by time left, but yeah. So it's like, I'm a drummer and I was taking drum lessons when I was, you know, 14 or whatever. And so by time, by time I was like, uh, you know, 16 and stuff, I had taken over the basement and turned it, took the ping pong table, made a drum riser out of it. And I had like all these posters and all of all the cool shows that were going on around McMaster University and Hamilton. parents were okay with it. Yeah. And so, you know, the, my dad would come down sometimes. He goes, what's that smell? And I go, dad, they're smoking American cigarettes. Oh, all right. <laughs> He's English, real British. And so he knew it was pot, but he let us smoke it. And so, uh, so it was cool. And so, yeah, we would just kind of have like, you know, a cool kind of like parties and just all kinds of stuff happening down there. A lot of people sometimes, and so, yeah, it was like I brought in a couch and some rugs and, you know, it was I was trying to, you know, make the 60s vibe, you know, like because I'd seen all these cool 60s shots and stuff like that. So I was always intrigued about that. And and I'm also kind of a um, I'm interested in architecture. I've always had some kind of knack. I really, really love, you know, I remember look finding a Playboy magazine and finding and then looking at the Playboy Mansion and the pool and all like that's where I want to go because <laughs> you know, it's, it's like amazing kind of architecture. And uh, so, yeah, so since I was a kid, I've been doing this and not realizing it until now that I put this book out and it's like, holy shit, I started there out of the basement. And then, you know, uh, and then I got a job at Grand Avenue Studio in Hamilton. And that's where I met Daniel Amois. So and, and, and there's a reason why people say, well, as that lady you talked to, she said, well, change the trajectory of your life. But it literally, and it sounds cliche, but I would have said the same thing. It, it's weird how things turn out. I mean, you, and then you got sick and it changed your attitude towards the world. But, but, but how do you look back at those two things? Uh, first of all, having that accident and then, then getting cancer and going through all yeah. these trials. I mean, and you're yeah. still here and there you are, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah the accident changed my you know, I was a live mixer and then that changed that whole thing. And then I got the studio job. And then with the cancer, um, you know, it, it changed the way I look at life and how I have to live every day to the fullest and just, you know, give back. And I've been, you know, I did a couple of concerts there in Toronto, one in Hamilton, and then the COVID thing hit and stalled all, all that till now. And so, yeah, so now I'm just kind of rebuilding and re to put this book out while I was through COVID and all this stuff. And, you know, the, the first book I wrote, Listen Up, uh, uh, the you know, the about kind of the behind the curtain of what went on on all these records. So this new record, Recording Icons and Creative Spaces, is is um, the sister to that book. So now you can get this one and see what I'm talking about, you know, and see the pictures of where what it really looked like, because it was the on Listen Up. It was just little black and white photos in there. So this is a nice, beautiful book with color photos and you know, there's some photographers that contributed to it, and but a lot of it is uh, just time lapse photography. Me putting my camera on the speaker or on the console and just taking shots in the room, and nobody knows, you know. And so that's how I got some beautiful shots of Tom Waits singing and Neil Young and it's like Neil this. Young. Those pictures, yeah. you feel those pictures. I yeah. felt that when I saw him, the close-ups, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, those ones, those actually, those ones were shot by a Adam Volok, was who was a video photographer guy that was hanging out at the studio, and so yeah, so it was a, it's a beautiful match of all kinds of different photos over the last thirty years. So, who's the I mean, naked I, lady? 
What's that? Who's the, the naked, naked lady? lady? That's my friend Renee, and she's a photographer, and she just loved my bike. And I said, will you take a picture naked on it? And she goes, yeah. And she just dropped her clothes off, and I just snapped a couple of shots. And it's so natural in there. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I looked at him going, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so um, – you know how it goes. It's just things just kind of happen. <laughs> when in Rome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When in Rome. Yeah, exactly. King Biscuit Boy. How did that start for you with him? Uh, with him? Well, I was working for a local PA company um, in Hamilton. This guy, Lou Frelinetto, he was, it was a, him and his brother ran uh, what was called the Guitar Clinic. And his brother made basses and they fixed guitars and sold guitars. And then downstairs was a workshop. And that's where we he uh, Lou would build PA cabinets and I would help him. And then I would go out on the road with these PA systems and stuff like that. So that's where I was getting all my kind of like knowledge of crossovers and consoles and mixing and stuff like that. So I, I could kind of really kind of recreate that live, you know, like that, what records should sound like live, you know, while I'm mixing all these bands. So, yeah, so that's kind of like how it started uh, um, in Hamilton. And so then I just got this tour through Lou and he said, well, you're going to go across Canada with King Biscuit Boy. He's a harmonica player and he's like a legendary blues guy. And I said, all right. And so we rented a cube van. There was seven guys and a dog. And we get in this cube van. And there was a guitar player from Hamilton called Mikey, uh, Guitar Mikey. He was one of the guys. And then Greg Stark was from Buffalo and he brought his dog. And, you know, it was just the the beginning of the craziness <laughs> that's about to happen. So we drove from Hamilton all the way to Vancouver for our first show uh, uh, at the gas light uh, pump or something like that, the gas pump. Yeah. And then... Um, and then, yeah, so Biscuit was, uh, he's an amazing blues guy. I got my whole blues education. You know, I'd be playing like the Blues Brothers. He goes, take that shit off. That's not blues. He's like, listen to this fucking Albert King and, you know, Little Walter and, you know, like the true, you know, people of the blues and stuff like that. And so he, he you know, he would play all those songs, you know, and plays this harp. And um, But he had an alcohol problem. He uh, it was really uh, a heavy alcoholic. And I think it may have shocked me at the time because I don't I never drank after that tour. I never drank alcohol since then. I was 19 years old and I saw what it did to him. It was just he'd be playing the harp and then just fall back into his amp. And then we'd be at a dinner table and he'd crawl up on the table and he'd grab spaghetti and put it on his head. And just like, you know, just just crazy stuff, you know, so um but I, I give him credit because after all those years, I looked back at his thing and I found out that he he had made uh, a record in New Orleans with the meters. And it was like and I listened to that record after I'd worked with the Neville brothers and some of the meter guys. And it's like, how did he get that? And, you know, how did he manage to do that? And so it's an amazing record. And he uh, and so, um, yeah, it's amazing to look back at like who you were working for. And then in Hamilton, it was uh, they had this place called the Leander Boat Club. And so they had this blues society in Hamilton and they would bring all these blues acts up. So I was working th this Leander Boat Club every Sunday or whatever. They had the event. And so like Albert King came through, Buddy Guy, you know, like all these legendary guys, you know, like it was it was, it was amazing to, to to see them. And so because of that, later in life, I knew who these blues people were. So talking to Dylan, you know, like, you know, oh, you know who little, little Walter is? Oh, yeah. like, And and same with the, you know, um, the King brothers, you know, Albert King, B.B. Uh, King, you know, they're um, they're all, you know, to, uh, you know, not many people studied, you know, blues or whatever. So and younger people around my age, you know, it was more Led Zeppelin and, you know, uh, that kind of stuff and Stones. Um, so yeah, so it, it was, I think that was a pretty big education for me. You know, I left school when I was 15 and, uh, I thought maybe I, I wanted to be an architect and I found this company in Hamilton, Ontario called Howard Mark Architects. And I thought, my name's Mark Howard. I'll have, to, uh, they'll probably hire me for sure. I went there and I showed him all these drawings I had of all these futuristic buildings and houses because these are fantastic. He said, go back to school, get your grade 12 and I'll hire you. 
And so, but didn't the guidance counselor tell tell you what the guidance counselor tell you before that happened? Oh, so yeah, so I wanted to quit school, and you know, I was missing a lot of classes, and and she was, I remember her name, Mrs. Chanowski, and she was like a little, you know, little witchy woman, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so uh, I said, look, I I want to get out, and she goes, you're just going to be nothing but a criminal and end up in jail. I said, all right, okay, we'll see, we'll see if uh, if I go, <laughs> and you know, years later, it kind of it made me stronger to like, I have to prove now that you know, I'm going to like you know surpass all that stuff i'm not a criminal and i'm not going to jail ever and so yeah so it was it was it was pretty pretty nutty yeah that was a defining moment too though because i i have moments like that where people say oh you'll never start a major market radio and part of me going yeah you know and and really when i said that i didn't believe it I'm going, he's probably right but what yeah. the hell i'm going to try <laughs> a little harder what was her yeah. name mrs mrs what Shinovsky. Shinovsky. Well, she's still alive and sees this. <laughs> <laughs> hey, by the way, what was your first impression of uh, of Daniel Lenoir? What was your first when you 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 first met him? What would you think? Um, I thought he was a, a cool guy. He was kind of like a he was a little eccentric, you know. Like he had long hair and he wore this bowler cap, and you know, he just came out of working on uh, U2's Joshua Tree. And so he came into Grand Avenue Studio after that to start his solo record. So there was another guy from Hamilton called Bill Dillon, who was a guitar player that um, Dan had used in the past. And so uh, so I was put on that session with Dan and Dan would always be trying to like stump me, like, you know, um, put my guitar on track 16 and get ready to record. I said, it's already plugged in and I got it on 16 already. He goes, how did you know that? I said, well, I turned you guys talking and i didn't thought you probably want to do a guitar thing after talking about it so go <laughs> you know and so he kept on trying to stump me and uh, with all these other things and and so uh that just uh, made him think well this kid's pretty uh, handy and so he invited me to come to new orleans to help him uh with a band called the neville brothers which i didn't know who the neville brothers was and I was confused. I thought it was the Everly Brothers. I was telling all my friends, I'm going to make a record with the Everly Brothers. It was like, it, was like, it ended up being the Neville Brothers. And uh, yeah, it was only supposed to be for six months. And so I had to uh, uh, leave my job at Grand Avenue. And Bob Deutsch, who's the owner there, he says, if you leave, your job's not here when you come back. I says, I know, I'm going to take a chance. And so uh, I flew to New Orleans. I met with Dan in, in the French Quarter. And uh, he had a, this a big apartment building he rented there. There was nothing in it but a bed. And it, and so he said, look, I'm leaving for uh, England in two days. And uh, I'll give you some numbers. Uh, to, we need to find a place to make the record. We need to uh, get all the gear in from Canada uh, and England and the U.S. We're buying a console from uh, Europe you'd already paid for. And uh, we need to set it up in a, in a find the location, set it up, and I'll be back in a month and we'll be ready to roll. And like, no, I'm 20 years old. <laughs> I'd never done any of this before. And so there was no computers. Yeah, he gave me a couple of phone numbers of like Manny's Music in New York and, and places like that. And uh, I had to bring the console in from England and find a way to import it without paying taxes. And And so I found how to get around all that stuff. And then I shipped stuff from Canada down because Dan had like this 24 track Studer tape recorder just sitting in Hamilton. And so he said, well, get it down here. And so I had st uh, cases made at uh, at the guitar center, at guitar clinic uh, where Lou. And so he made these cases and shipped them to me in New Orleans. And so I got them. And they like the tape recorder is the size of a refrigerator. And it was like it was pretty crazy. And the console was like, you know, 10 feet long and in a road case, too, and came in from England. And so I rented this crazy apartment building in uh, in the uh, it's called the Garden District in New Orleans. And so I found this uh, five story apartment building for sale. And so I had this real estate agent, David Zolkine. I said, well, make him an offer that if it's for sale. Tell him we'll take it for six months and I'll pay all the money up front. And so he went to the guy and he said, yeah, sure, I'll take it. And so I paid him all the money. And it was like only $1,500 a month or something like that for a five-story apartment building. And so it was pretty incredible that um, I got it. I showed pictures to Dan. He says, looks great. Let's do it. 
but it was on the second floor where we were going to be working. And so I had to hire all these guys from the jazz fest, like uh, crew guys to get the console. And because it had to go upstairs, it wouldn't fit in the elevator. So they had to jimmy it on its end and then kind of like go around the corner, going up all these stairs. And so we had this rule, you'd lose a finger before you dropped it, <laughs> you know? So if, uh, if you smash it on something, you like, yeah, couldn't drop it. Anyways. Yeah. So that uh, I ended up, getting the whole thing up, set up, and then Dan came in, and and then we were preparing for the Neville Brothers Yellow Moon record. So it was pretty exciting. What was your impression of, of them? And, of course, you learned, I mean, you, you know, you sound like a guy that that you, you're pretty good on your feet. So what, what's, uh, what was your impression of them, and what were they like to work with? I'd gone to a couple of shows to see what they were like live, and it's it's, it's amazing live, you know. Like, it's, it's funky. It's like they're they're the... The people that invented funk, you know, like the meters and, you know, uh, Cyril and Art were in the meters. And uh, and then you got Aaron Neville, who he sang Tell It Like It Is in the 1950s. And that was a big hit. Tell it like it is. You know, like, uh, you know, he's got that beautiful. That vibrato, yeah. Vibrato in his voice, yeah. And so uh, when I met them, they're a, hey, motherfucker, would you? And like, I couldn't understand them, like, because like, I'm like, you know, it's from... I don't understand Southern language, uh, uh, kind of uh, their uh, the way they talk, and so they go, "Go in the stove, close the door," <laughs> you know, like all this kind of like lingo, you know, and trying to figure out what they're talking about. And so working with them was kind of interesting. And um, uh, our, uh, Aaron would say, uh, uh, "Take me to first voice, the first voice." And, oh, oh, okay. Here's no, no, the first voice, the voice, voice. Uh, what what this is the first voice they recorded no the first voice first verse <laughs> but they say voice <laughs> voice it sounds like voice but it's a verse you know so it took me a while to get the hang of their lingo and stuff like that but you know they, they know then, about canada were they familiar i mean i mean i hate to sound ignorant but uh when when they found out you were canadian did 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 did, did they have any stories about canada or preconceived um, ideas or well, Charles Neville was on tour in Canada and some guy threw a joint into his sax bag and he crossed the border and they found it. He spent nine years in Angola prison for that. You know, it was pretty, crazy heavy, you know, so they knew Canada was like, you know, tough to, on the <laughs> on getting in and out. But I think that they, they knew that we were kind of green to what the Southern culture was. You know, uh, I made two records with the Neville Brothers, and on the second record, we made it in the French Quarter in this big, huge um, villa, kind of a like mansion, I would say, more than villa. Um, and so I had a bunch of motorcycles there, uh, 10 Harley Davidsons in the garage. And so Cyril comes over and I go, Cyril, I, I want to show you all the bikes we got now, because I only had one bike when I made Yellow Moon. And so, and he, he liked bikes. And so I brought him in the garage and I had like, you know, the 1936 knucklehead, pan heads, shovel head, like the, the choice bikes of all periods, all star beautifully kept. And so I brought him in to show him all these bikes. And, and then he looks, looks over through them all. And then he looks at the wall and he goes, what's that on the wall? I go, it's the biker flag. He goes, take that down right now. I'm like, why? He goes, you don't know what that means. I said, no. That's it's a rebel flag. That's all I knew. I was like, you know, I had no idea that it, what it meant stand, stood for uh, for a black person, you know. And so I take it off, throw it in the garbage can right in front of him because I didn't learn any southern history in Canada. We know, didn't. So we didn't. We I was blind to it, you know. And, and the racism, you know, come from Hamilton. There is no was no ra racism back then because there wasn't very many um black people there was only one black kid in my school you know and when so, i heard you say that in the interview i remember you mentioned the person too by name uh for me one chinese person in, in miramichi lucy yeah. lucy yeah yeah and same uh, one indian girl in my grade third class well how did you uh, know to be cool i mean was that it was that intrinsically something that you knew like you'd mentioned in interviews that and i know that from a radio guy we are the bottom feeders of entertainment but still we're in that in, in that arena where yeah. we learn backstage before we introduce a band yeah, and, and not to, to be cool. And as you've mentioned many times, you don't say to Robert Plant, remember that time on Zeppelin two, you know, you don't, you yeah, don't yeah. do that. Yeah. But 
how did did you learn that by watching? Did you just pick that up? How did you learn to be cool? Um, I just think it was like I'm I was never intimidated by stardom or people or who they were, like, you know, not even Bob Dylan or anybody. Like it was it was it, because I'm working, I gotta like maintain a work ethic, you know, and like, you know, get the stands, the mic stands in, everything plugged in and just, you know, ask them questions about like, you know, their guitar and they tell me different stories about what they like to play and stuff like that. So it was on a more of a, um, a musical kind of like uh, um, palette of kind of talking with them. And you can't be starstruck or, you know, like, uh, 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 you know, none of that. You can't have that because you're you're about to like wor you're working all the time with him. So, yeah. So a lot of the time, you know, you're just shooting the shit. And Bob Dylan saw that I had one motorcycle outside of the studio and he came up to me. He goes, Mark, can you can you get me one of those? I said, yeah. And so, you know, I got him this beautiful 1966 Harley Davidson shovelhead. First year of the shovelhead classic bike. Uh, electric glide electric blue color like really incredible so he came early into the studio once i brought it back he, i had to go to florida to pick it up on the weekend while we weren't working and so i he brought it i brought it back and he takes it out and i go with him with my bike and i said okay, follow me where i'll and i'll show you how to get to the uh to the levee and so and we just drive along the top of the levee with the Mississippi on one side. And then that kind of cuts down and you go over this bridge and then you go through all these like trees that look like um, a tunnel. And it's like with the moss hanging down, it was right. like really incredible with big Antimel mansions on all over the place. And so I told him how to get out of town. And, and then so then he started taking rides by himself. And so I think that uh, opened up a lot of things because motorcycle riding it, it's a time to think and, you know, all your ideas because, you know, it's just kind of like a place where you go. To but he didn't wear a helmet. He wouldn't wear a helmet. Well, he, he I told him it was helmet, but he never did. And he'd come back sometimes because the police are so friendly around here. They keep waving at me. I go, they're waving at you because you don't have a helmet on. And so, yeah, so it was uh, crazy events. It, and so that's what uh, Listen Up, the book is about, all these kind of crazy stories that or kind of behind the curtain that nobody knows about. So. A friend of mine was telling me, he was saying that he says, uh, I told him I was going to talk to you. And he says, there's this picture. He says, there's this picture where I, I think it was the Joni Mitchell one where you're, you're, you're looking on the side. I think it's Joni in the back. Was it Joni? Um, but he said, he looks like the coolest dude in the world, man. <laughs> <laughs> you're looking like a dude in a lot of those pictures, man. You're looking like, you know, you're, it's, it's really like you, Obviously, you get in the room because you've got the talent. You know how to act. You're, you know, you're comfortable in your skin, especially yeah. around them. But there's that element in rock and roll that that there's a certain coolness to be able to do that. And you yeah. can tell the fakers usually, yeah. but yeah, yeah. you seem like you're comfortable in your skin in those pictures. Yeah, yeah. I just, uh, you know, the, in the earlier ones, you know, I had long hair or whatever. And uh, so, uh, and then at one point I'd cut my hair really short, but then I thought, oh, I'm, I'm going to grow it back. And so, so there's like a different periods where I've got short hair and then long hair and a beard and stuff. But now I've got no hair because uh, cancer. Thank you. And uh, so I support a different look. <laughs> Brian Eno, you know, I, I, I programmed new age music for a long time okay. and I know you probably okay. hate that term. But yeah. but I love that kind of, you know, music for airports. So I love all that stuff. But what was your impression of him and what was he like to work with? And I remember the airport story. You did bring the sign, yeah, right? Dan, well, Dan said, take a sign. And I refused to take a sign. I was in, too embarrassed to hold up a sign. And, That's not cool, man. I'll find him somehow. I didn't know what he looked like. But yeah, I just stood there. The, in those days, you could walk right to the gate when people came off yeah. the thing. And I just go, you know, Brian, Brian, Brian. But no, oh, and then Brian, before I even said that, he looked at me and I knew it was him. And he said, Mark. And I said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and so uh, that's how it started. And then, you know, uh, and then Dan uh, said, I want you to work with Brian in the mornings, just uh, just you and him. And so, uh, you know, so this is kind of like where I started to learn how is ambient music is made and how technically on how how things are, are done. And so we were working on this one song and 
we uh, we had these bells that we had taken and slowed down, and so it was like, Dong. so it was like you know, as a, you know, thinking about recording, like he's always got these weird kind of abstract ways of mixing and and getting sounds, and then we had we were putting uh, these. Um, he was going. He has this thing called a DX7 keyboard. It's like an old. Uh, Everyone had one in the eighties. Legendary, yeah. So yeah. he reprogrammed it and he put up all of his own sounds in it. He's the master of it. And so one day we're in the studio. I have the window open, and there's these bugs in New Orleans called cicadas, and they would make this yeah. like this kind of like kind of creepy kind of sound. And so Brian had this uh, patch called insects. So he would play like these these little melodies with these insect sounds like and then he'd stop and then the insects from outside went like did you hear that he goes yeah i said play a different melody he plays a different melody and they follow it so he's communicating with these insects it's so bizarre (laughs) it was incredible someone had died in rock and roll and i talked to a bandmate like two years ago and I was asking him, I said, you know what, being, he was, t- I'm, I'm 62 and the guy had like at least 15 years on me. Oh, I was younger then, obviously. But uh, I asked him, I said, you know, you can't, your f- friend came close to death and you're thinking about, I mean, you can't cheat the hangman, but sometimes as Patrick Simmons would say in the Doobie Brothers, what did that, what did that do to you as far as being a man on this earth, doing what you did? No one can cheat that. I mean, it, it hits you. How, yeah. how did it make you think about your immortality or how, what, how did that change you? Um, it was weird because just, I never thought I was ever going to die. And I had stage four cancer and everybody had me pegged to die. They thought there's no way you're going to come back. Once it goes to stage four, it's really hard to, to become you know, a survivor, you know, because it was. Well, as they say, I, there's no stage five. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the end of the line. And so because it was spreading rapidly. You know, I had skin cancer, melanoma cancer on my shoulder here. I was, I took my kids to Hawaii and my one daughter, Taya, she goes, dad, what's that, that black spot? I go, that's just a mole. Cause you should look, have that looked at, you know, I said, all right. So after our Christmas thing there in Hawaii, I went and booked an appointment at the dermatologist and he said, yeah, that's cancer. I'm cutting it off right now. And he didn't do any <laughs> testing on it. He just cut a big, huge hole in my shoulder. And, um, and so uh, sure enough, it it was healing and it was like this, it was like, like this, you know, size of, you know, pretty big that he cut out. He just wanted to make sure there was nothing around it. But because he cut that out and uh, what happened is oxygen got in there and fed it and it's, and it started to feed. And so uh, he said, I want you to go see, see a, um, a cancer doctor. And so I made an appointment. And so yeah, sure enough, it was, but it was spreading. By the time I got to the cancer doctor, it split, uh, spread to my liver and to my spleen. And I thought, oh, shit. So they put me on this uh, clinical trial right away, which was kind of crazy and, and was in Los Angeles. And so they almost killed me because they wouldn't, my insurance covered, wouldn't only cover a certain amount. And it, But clinical trials, it's free. So I did all this testing and my blood came back and it wasn't the right type for this thing. So I couldn't do it. So I had to, and then my insurance wouldn't cover it. So then I, I came back to Canada and I had went to Princess Margaret Hospital and this doctor, Dr. Butler, he's like the master of skin cancer, melanoma. He's got a laboratory in the basement and he's got all of his kind of like crazy kind of like uh, uh, trials that he's putting on to see if they work. And he says, I have this one trial um, that uh, they haven't approved yet in Canada, but I can start it with you. And so it was kind of a little bit, touchy and so and then so part of the the um it was called immune therapy and it's you know it's become really popular now and so but it only works on 40 percent of the people and not everybody gets it and so um so we uh, started on that but part of the uh clinical trial was that i was supposed to get this inve- injection into the tumor to to um ignite the uh immune therapy to to go fight it and it'll eat it and well it's eaten it'll eat the cancer off my shoulder and so we started with that but canada hadn't approved the injection part of it and only just kind of the uh the drip that they put in your arm like a chemotherapy and then so i had to go back to los angeles to to get these injections that were approved by this other doctor there 
And so I got two shots of this. And what it is, is was a, a herpes uh, simplex virus that they pumped into me. It's not herpes, but it's like the same kind of like uh, kind of way it's built. And so they injected that into the tumor and it, the tumor went down it was flat. It was, it was like a baseball on my shoulder. You know, it was like huge, like big black boil like thing. It just, ew, it was horrible, like an alien or something. And so we did the injection into it. And then sure enough, two weeks later, it come down. And so I was scheduled to go to another one. And the ho um, the, the hospital, uh, or they wouldn't approve the second one because it was $30,000 a shot. And so I, he said, well, we got one in the fridge. We're not supposed to, we're supposed to throw it away. And so he went behind the door and, you know, I got another shot of it. And then after that, I had to come back up and finish the rest of my treatment. And so I did two years on this and uh, it wiped it out. And so I, I, I know after, you know, while I was waiting for all these things, it had gone to my brain. And then I had to have like emergency brain radiation and, and stuff. I'm not sure if you can see it, but the back of my hair, it's like black here. And yeah, black. yeah, I see that. Yeah. Uh, so that's where the radiation stopped, you know, where that's black is my natural hair. And then the radiation was on top. That's why all my hair went white, my eyebrows and eyelashes and I thought I was going blind uh, for a while because everything was so blurry, yeah. but my eyelashes are white. Oh, and so what that does, it just kind of blurs everything when they're black, the levels let out, but so it's kind of, kind of weird. But anyways, yeah, it was a long story and just kind of going back and forth. And, and but uh, I, 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 you know, the whole time I never thought I was going to die. But, but what people is that? thought is, I was going to die. And of course they did. But what is that in you? Uh, what do you think you, um, did, did, do you, uh, I don't want to get all new agey, but are you a type of person that knows things intrinsically? I mean, how I would have been shaking through my boots, but that's a real knowing that, and you didn't die. Yeah. You're here. You were. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I did this also while I was doing this treatment, I was doing, I researched myself, you know, because doctors only tell you so much. I would say, well, what should I eat? Should I, you know, kind of eat? He goes, eat anything. But then you research it, sugar is bad, it feeds the cancer. And so I stopped all sugars and stuff like that. And so um, a friend of mine uh, was making some uh, marijuana oil. And so he gave me a jar of this marijuana oil, uh, cannabis oil. And um, uh, and so I would just put a little bit on a cracker every night and eat it. And then uh, I would go and I did that for a month and I went in. And Dr. Butler was like, wow, this is amazing. This is really working fast on you. I said, well, I'm doing this other thing too. He goes, keep doing it, keep doing it. And like, you know, he promoted me to do this uh, cancer thing. And um, so, yeah, sure. I, I, so I think between the immune therapy and then eating this uh, cannabis oil, I think it, it really worked faster than it was supposed to. And so um, it saved my life, I think. So and so my brother in England, I was telling him about, about this whole thing and he got prostate cancer. And so he went in to have it done and marijuana is illegal in England. So we had to sneak it to get him some of that. And so he did that for a couple of months and then he went back and got scanned and they couldn't find the, uh, the prostate cancer. And they said, we know it's in there, but we can't see it. And, and so, it's uh, and so uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy uh, how it all works. But and so it worked on me, worked on him, and so and then I have friends here in Los Angeles, and their kid has uh, you know um, you know crazy illness, and so they they doctors can't help him, and they give him some, and it calmed him down, and and it worked with their child. So, but you know you can't really go around, yeah, telling you so that stuff. But it, yeah, so. It's, it's you, you got to be your own doctor in the way, you know, like you can't just trust them because, you know, doctors are, you know, they want you on certain kind of drugs so that they get paid back from the drug company. And like, you don't know who's telling the truth, you know, so you have to make it upon yourself to kind of choose what, which uh, avenue you're going to go down. And because he said, if I would have done uh, chemotherapy, I would have died. He says most people that do chemotherapy die. You know, and so and and they said, you know, two years ago, uh, there was no immune therapy and you probably would have died. And he said, I can keep you alive for at least a year. 
and and on this thing and it's like are okay <laughs> i was like so it's it's it, you get you know fed the scary stuff and um you know that the doctor here in los angeles was this german guy and uh he was the one that broke the news to me that had gone to my brain i was supposed to start this immune therapy and and so i go there with my daughter and we're waiting in the chair for them to put it in me and, and the nurse comes over and she goes uh, the doctor wants to talk to you i said all right we go in and there's dr burrs he's german and it's like i have some bad news i'm like what he goes the cancer has now gone to your brain and I'm like, we need to do emergency radiation. And I'm like, what? I'm going to die now. <laughs> and uh, my daughter started crying. I was crying. He was crying. It was like, a, it was pretty crazy. So I ended up doing this radiation and and I uh, had this crazy thing called brain fog. And I was like out there, like a complete yeah, zombie. Yeah. So, and, and it, it kind of appears every now and again, I kind of, this cloud kind of comes and I get all weird and then suddenly it kind of disappears. But I think uh, it's all to do with, you know, them messing with my brain. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but before they gave you radiation and that before he told you it was in your brain, did you feel any different in that? No, as... no, I, I felt totally like Listen, I never had your... other than just the pain, uh, a little bit of pain from the, the bulgingness of, of the tumor. Um, that was about the only pain I had. Which and then once it was down, uh, they shrunk it down to my shoulder. Shoulder. Uh, I didn't have. There was no real side effects. And then once I went on immune therapy, the only side effect was that I was itchy all the time. And so that's uh, it, it's on different people. It works different ways. And so, so yeah. So it was all kind of crazy events. You know, I'm probably going to write a book on cancer pretty soon. <laughs> so I think um, your story is an to. amazing story. I mean, I was I I replayed. Uh, I forget who it was. The the uh, I can tell you right now. Um, because uh, I, I like I said, oh the uh, the NWC interview you did that channel. Okay. Uh, I, right. you know, the, I love the way you were talking about it, but anyone, I mean, you know, the classic rockers love my channel because I, you know, I talk to them. They don't, they never look at me and say, you look old because they're freaking old too. And yeah. they're all 10 years older than me. But I noticed that when I talk about a it's strange, right? you're not surprised by this, bro. death, health, diets. I like your story about, you know, the fact that uh, no carbs on, on Iggy pop, yeah. um, but we'll talk about that in a second. But they're they're thinking about all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's important to them. They don't, of course, Aunt Louise or you know Grandpa Bob or whatever. They're all dealing with this kind of stuff. So I, I think it's a great idea. And you talk about it because you've been there, right? Yeah, the exactly. Thing. Yeah. So yeah. But so I, uh, you know, I, I was trying to give back, and I was doing these concerts. I did one in Toronto and brought you know Sarah McLaughlin, every you know the biggest artist I knew of Canada. <laughs> And Randy Backman and uh, uh, Sam Roberts. And so it worked out really great. So I got some money for the, I, I wanted to make money for D Dr. Butler's uh, uh, immune therapy treatments for those people. And so he was happy about that. And he came to the show and he did a little speech. It was pretty good. And uh, so, yeah, so you gotta, if you gotta give back. So I, I just try to do everything I can to promote, you know, immune therapy and uh, you know, and um marijuana oil. <laughs> bob dylan uh interesting uh, stories about bob dylan i i didn't know i mean do you um, when he was goofing off and danielle basically got mad one day and i know you were saying that it that happened as well uh, uh, with uh, time out of mind but you didn't share that story what happened with that last interview i know that what happened when he like what's he do is he just you know, I met Gordy Howe once and I remember going and Gordy was doing fidgety noises. I was at, yeah. I used to love hockey cards and my kids loved them. We'd go to hockey shows a lot right. and, that, and our station would present a lot of hockey shows. So I met okay. Bernie Perrant, my favorite hockey player. But anyway, right. I, I, Gordy Howe was there and he was making funny noises. And the guy beside me says, well, everyone has isms as they get older. He's making funny old no. man stories, right? Sometimes yeah. it's not because he's a big star. It's just what happens. Uh, yeah. What was it about Bob Dylan? Like what, like why would he, it sounded like he was like when you were trying to mic him up there and Daniel got mad. Is, is that an ism? Like, what do you think makes, why would he do that? Well, uh, he's got a temper <laughs> and he can lose it easily. And so he gets frustrated. And uh, if, if he doesn't get his way, he's like, he really, he can show it. You know, he's, he calls it passion. 
I call it crazy. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, yeah, so, you know, Bob had come in and this was the first time we'd met Bob. And so that we didn't have any kind of like, uh, you know, no, no, knew who he was or how he worked or whatever. So he was kind this of like testing mercy, right? us. This is all mercy. mercy. Yeah. So he was testing, testing us in, in a, in a, you know, bizarre way. And Dan wasn't putting up with it. See, Dan is, he's, he's more of a cheerleader. Like it works great for you too. And he cheers Bono on. That's great. Now let's try another one. And like, yeah, really give it. And just like, just trying to like get all the energy out of people and suck it out of them and stuff like that. And that didn't work for Bob. And so he didn't have that, you know, and didn't know how to get around it. Cause you know, like when you first meet somebody, you got to learn how how to you know, learn how they work. And, you know, with me, it's always about trust. If you gain their trust, you have the license to try anything. But if they don't trust you, then it's uh, it gets very difficult and you get real kind of a lot of butting heads. And so um, I'm lucky I, I get away with it a lot that way. Uh, but with him, it was, uh, yeah, we, we Bob was just kind of like sloppily strumming and just it just flipped dan out it's like that's it and he grabs his dobro and bob wouldn't wear headphones so i had like these two monitors like on a live show you know in front of him like these e we call them ev wedges and so dan grabbed this thing and he goes oh fucking shit and he just picks it up and slams it right on this monitor puts a big dent in the back of this metal dobro and Bob like just goes, oh, fuck. And I just get up. I walk out the door. And I think if they're going to kill themselves, <laughs> I don't want to be the witness. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I, I walked out, went into we had a little guest house and that was set up, you know, a little kitchenette and stuff. So I went and got a tea. And in the meantime, Bob, I heard the door open and Bob walked out. And so I went in there and there's the Dobro laying on the floor. And uh, and uh, Dan was gone. On the, and so I just closed the studio down for the night. And then the next day, it was like nothing happened. Bob comes in. He's a little more kind of like respective because for the first two weeks of that record, he never said my name, didn't even acknowledge I was in the room. And so he was playing his kind of like cards, you know, to see, you know, what's going to happen kind of thing. So uh, but then we hit we hit it off with motorcycles. And so ever since then, it's like that was the first time he said, hey, Mark. Can you get me one of those? It was like, oh, okay, you know who I am now. <laughs> you know, not just like this guy floating around. Yeah. And yeah. For the it, he was being a little cheeky in the beginning, just with, you know, I put the microphone in front of him and then he'd turn over here. I put the microphone over here and he'd go back over here. And then he'd get up and then he'd go into the piano room. And he'd be playing on the piano. And uh I'd move the whole drum set into that room. And then he get up off the piano, come back into the kitchen where the studio was. And I bring the whole drum set back. And it was like chasing him around. <laughs> it was, it was you were getting good... your cardio. Yeah, yeah. And we had three grand pianos in in uh, uh, um, the recording room. It was really the living room. But it was in you know, high ceilings, beautiful, ornate and stuff. And so uh, he kept on going. We had a 19, uh, 1800 Steinway and uh c like uh, b series and then we had a um a steinway a newer one a 1980s steinway that they used at the jazz fest for uh stage and stuff like that and then we had this old baldwin kind of uh eight foot um grand and so uh dan got up the nerve one day because bob kept on going to the to the baldwin to to try you know uh his songs out um and uh and so he asked bob he goes bob like I'm thinking about buying one of these pianos. They've loaned them to us. And uh, and I was just curious, like, um, why do you keep coming to the Baldwin piano? Like, is it something like in the in the action? Or is it something that you really like about it? And, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, and Bob turns around to him and looks at him in the eye and goes, nah, it's the only one with a stool or a, a seat, you know, like so the other pianos. And so he didn't want to move it. So he just kept to go to the one where this he could sit down and play. So it was pretty crazy. From your perspective, what what, what do you think from, from being there? I will talk about time out of mind in a second, but what, what to you makes him great? I mean, the, I mean, this is like a, 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 a Captain Obvious question. But yeah. for you personally, what, what what do you think it is that 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 he plugged into so many different g generations and right? Well, I think uh, you know my whole thing is about lyrics. So uh, I like to 
listen to songs that create images in my mind, you know, like that you take you on a voyage. He's a master of that. And to see what he does and how he does it is a pretty amazing education in itself. You know, it was like, that was my English education working on those records. Cause I would have to write down the, the lyrics and so, cause he wasn't going to give us the lyrics. So in my workbook, I would write the first word and last word of each verse. And every time he listened, I'd fill it in, you know. And so every now and again, he'd come over and look at my book and to see what, what verses he had and whatever stuff like that. So we'd always be going over lines like that. But he's amazing at, at um, kind of like uh, being able to take the listener and uh, kind of like give them, uh, you have to really listen into it. And that's why, you know, he, he got kind of put on this pedestal because people were thinking in the early days that, you know, he's like, uh, times are changing and, you know, that whole thing. And he he wrote that 10 years before that, all that stuff happened. That had nothing to do with this kind of thing. So, and so uh, he's, he's really great at kind of self-editing and just kind of like coming up and he'll do two, two different kind of like takes of the song and changes lyrics around just to see how they feel. And then, He'll change the key to see if his voice sounds better in a higher key or lower key. So every take has got kind of the, all these kind of searching things, which I learning early on, you know, that helps me with my production and helping people and, and stuff like that. And so, but he is an amazing lyricist and you, you can't deny it. It's like, he's one of the best I've ever seen. <laughs> you said before that the gentleman that I just prefaced a while ago, you, he 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 asked you so what is it about you know the big artists it was a great question is there a common denominator between the big artists and you said they're all well read which makes so much sense it's crazy you know like when you start looking at it and and, and how where they get some of their lyric lines is like working with robert plant he comes into the studio and he's got a satchel and he goes this is all the songs of all the women i've loved and hated and uh, and then on top of that, he's got this uh, William Blake uh, poetry book. Right. And so as we we're kind of looking for new songs, he's looking through there and, you know, picking up some cool lines out of them. And so and so when I look back at, at uh, um, Time Out of Mind, you know, I was looking through one of these poetry books one day and then sure enough, there it is, black and white, Time Out of Mind. You lifted that from there. It's like, you bastard. They're all thieves. Tom Waits is like, he takes like chunks right out of the New York Times. And, you know, like doesn't, you know, that's it. Boom. It's like, he's, he's, uh, they're all thieves. Was it Tom Waits that said the, how did he say it when he wanted the, 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 the volume up? Was it Tom Waits that have? Yeah, 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 yeah. What he's did he got say? All these kind of particular weird ways of talking and stuff. And so he, he instead of saying, just turn my voice up, you, you go, put a little more hair on it. And I'm like, oh, hair, here's the hair button. How's that sound? And so he really means make it louder or just make it more exciting. Uh, but he, he could turn it around on me and he goes, drums sound a little beige. I'm like, beige, that's bad. I hate beige. <laughs> I brighten them up and make them sound exciting, you know? So he had all, all these kind of quirky kind of little things, you know, to make you kind of like push push the limits. And I made a record called Real Gone. And I swear, I, I just push that to the limit you could possibly go. And that's why it's got that crazy title, I think. Tom Waits to you is? He is uh, he is he is also an amazing kind of um, uh, lyricist. And, you know, just, just to watch him write, it's different than Bob because he he comes from a different angle, maybe. And um but where he comes uh, from, it's uh, really kind of like um, he turns it around on you. It's like he'll do, he'll do things. Him and Kathleen, his wife, uh, she'll say, "Don't give it away in the first verse." You know, let him think about it, and then give him the put the first verse where the last verse is, or and just you know, it's it's creative how they kind of take it in chunks and move stuff around and and. Uh, you know, I, you know, I love the way Tom plays piano and sings and and all my friends are going, you make sure you get him playing piano and singing. And we didn't. I did. It, it was not that kind of record. And it was kind of real strange. Tom would be uh, uh, it was in a schoolhouse. And so I had uh, a setup in the girls bathroom just with a mic in there. And um, this guy called Brain, 
he was a drummer and he'd come in with like a sampler and and he would and so he was in the bathroom we were doing like a snare overdub to give it that big kind of open sound and then so i had that mic on and me and uh, tom are sitting at the desk and uh Tom goes, what does that sound? I go, that's brain. He's taking a piss. And you hear him open the stall door and it slam. Dunk. He goes, what was that? I go, that's a stall door slamming. He goes, I want to use that sound. And I'm like, really? Okay. And, and so on this one song, you can he plays the door, slam, and then hits a piece of wood on the wall. Kunk, 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 kunk. And so that was the rhythm of the song. And it was like pretty crazy. And uh, and then so so then I had the snare drum in there that he was working well on and he was trying to deaden up so he had this gaffer tape and he's going Shush, putting on there and tom heard that going through he goes i want to use that too so that's a snare sound Shush, using the tape tearing the snape up and it was it was crazier you know ways of you know making records so it was pretty cool what was time out of mind with dylan like what was that experience like okay you're back in uh, yeah that, uh, that was well, a big album holy moly you know it's it started off as um uh, Bob had asked us to to mix uh, a live show that he had done. So it all started like, you know, Bob coming out. I had this theater in Oxnard, California called the Teatro. And it was a 1940s Mexican porno cinema that I renovated <laughs> into, made it into a studio. I took all the seats out and built a platform in the center. I didn't do it, but my assistant did. And so I turned that into like the really great kind of like workshop is that the one where all the where the all the guitars are in the yeah, seats all on the seats okay, yeah sorry go ahead the, yeah yeah so um so yeah so it was like a, a a good workshop for us and so we started there uh with dylan mixing this record uh uh um shows from atlanta it was when uh, the olympics were in atlanta and he did some house of blue shows and they asked us to mix them just, you know, I think. And so when he would come in to listen to them and stuff like that. And so during that period, he would go over to the piano and he, he'd play something on the piano. And he goes, hey, Daniel, what do you think of that? And Dan goes, that's great. But, you know, I'd like to hear some lyrics. And and then that was all that happened. And then the next day, Bob would come in and play something different. Dan, what do you think of this one? Well, that's great again. But, you know, I really need to hear some songs, you know. And so, and so, and on the the next time we had our friend from New York, uh, um, Tony Mangurian. He's a drummer and producer. He produced a bunch of great records. Um, and so, what it was is Bob started playing the song on the on the piano, and I had a mic in front of him in case he sang or whatever. And so he started singing, "I can't wait, I can't wait," you know, like. And then Tony starts drumming this hip hop beat against it, and it was like wow, the hair on my arms went up. I go, this is amazing, you know? And so he only sang like a verse and a chorus and that's all he did. And so then I took that and I, after he left, I turned that into a song. I just repeated the first chorus and all the verses and stuff. So it sounds like a real song all the way through, but same lyric. So, and Bob is playing uh, the beautiful kind of like gospel type of piano against it. It was really amazing. And then um, with this hip hop beat, it, it was like, oh, okay, now th this is a cool direction to go. And he was, while we were doing that, he goes, what do you think of this kid back? And we said, oh yeah, he's cool. And he goes, I, I would make a record like that. And so we said, oh, with samples and stuff. So we started on these building these little sample things for him to listen to and stuff like that. So Tony and Dan would play like these little percussion things on top of like these uh, loops that I made of little Walter and stuff like that. And so it sounded like these old blues records with this high quality kind of stuff on top. And, and so, but Bob would always come in every day and he said, between my house uh, and to get to Oxnard, there's this radio station that only comes on in between that uh, peer, in between that space. And he said, they play all these old blues records and it's, it's amazing. And he goes, why can't I have a record that sounds like that? I said, she can, but we just have to approach it like the old style, you know, old microphones and, you know, keep things minimal. And he goes, oh, cool. And so that's kind of like how it started developing the sound of Time Out of Mind. And so while I'm mixing this uh, show from Atlanta, the very last song comes on. I'm mix I've mixed it. And it's got a harmonica. And Bob goes, can you make it sound electric? 
the harmonica? I said, yeah, sure. And so I took the, the feed from the tape and ran it into a little uh, Ibanez uh, tube screamer. Where it is, this is the one. <laughs> and so I ran it through this and then That's ran it. That's actually the one? It's actually the one, yeah. And so, uh, and then these are behind me. I'm not sure if you can see, there's a big row of tweed amps. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I ran it into this like um, 1950s uh, deluxe uh, uh, Fender amp. And so the harmonica come on and it had this like really cool electric kind of vibe. And the, but right after that, he starts singing into that same mic and his voice co goes through the thing and he goes, that's what's that? I go, that's cool. And he goes, I want to put that on all the songs. And so I had to remix everything, putting this vocal amp on it. And so that became the sound of that that whole and you'd always say what's the percentage uh, are we at with the the clean vocal and the amp i go we're about 60 40 clean because make it 50 50 and you know like i'd make it and so that's how i had this gravelly kind of old kind of blues type sound you know and so that became the kind of sound of uh time out of mind where i would um uh, take a, a line off of uh the, his vocal mic feed it through that tube screamer into the into a little tweed amp and so he that was his monitor i wouldn't he wouldn't wear headphones and you just hear himself coming out of this broken off you know i was like it, was, it sounded cool yeah so yeah so it's it's so that's how it started uh, uh and so I, I was ready i had all these great things set at teatro and then he comes in one day and goes look i can't work here it's it's too close to home and so he says uh i want to work in miami and so we're like, Miami, <laughs> what? we got a great sound here. And so he goes, no, it's, it's just, I'm not going to get it work done here with the family and all this stuff around me. So we, I moved all, like I brought three old Neve consoles with me, all of my microphones I was working with. Once I got to Miami, the the classic room that they had that, that you know, that they made, you know, Eric Clapton's Ocean Boulevard on and, you know, all the classic records uh, uh, were made in this room but they've changed this room and now that room was their storage place and it had shag rug all over the walls and was is like this, this the old bg's place where bg's recorded before the bg's did some recordings there yeah and so when i got there i didn't like the sound of the room it was, it was they changed the studio around and now it was like this big sound stage and it was a big spitty room and it's where they shoot videos and stuff there and uh, so I couldn't, uh, I, I had, from the get go, I was like searching for another place to, to, to go. And so I, I called the BG studio. I was like, can we work over at your studio? And they said, no, no, we're busy. And so we couldn't go there. And I found a Masonic temple. I thought I could do a setup in the Masonic temple, and, but they wouldn't let us use it. And so we, we ended up just kind of putting it up with, with it in, in, uh, in Miami at criteria. criteria. And um, <laughs> Uh, so I built Bob this little tiny uh, apartment with gobos. And so it had windows. And so he was like private to be in there. And, you know, and uh, he had his focal lamp in there and a table and all this stuff. And and uh, and then I had a set of speakers set up in front of him in case I had to do a playback. So because he would refuse to wear headphones. Right. And so uh, so it was, it was it got to be crazy there. And so. We were working on this one track. Um, we we'd recorded um, "I Can't Wait" already, and uh, we, we got a cool version of it. And uh, I always name my takes, so it was like the rag doll version, and then this one had more of a Pink Floyd intro, and so ended up being this rag doll doll version that we. It's a completely different vibe of the "Can't Wait." He played at the Teatro, and Dan was adamant about getting back to that. And Dan would work up the band before before Dylan would walk into the studio. And, uh, and so sure enough, Bob walks in right in the middle of him working up this can't wait uh, kind of track to get it back to that gospel thing. And, and Bob goes, what, the, what the hell are you guys doing? And Dan was mimicking Bob, I can't wait, you know, on the microphone and he caught a little bit of that. And so it kind of like uh, jolted him. And uh, so Dan says, I want to, I want to, get back to that can't wait and he goes no we we got it it's done and and uh and he said come on let's let's see if we can get back to that oxnard version you know where it was more gospel he goes no we did it and it's it's done and and he goes i'd never do anything twice the same and then he brought tony garnier into it and he goes tony have i ever done anything exactly the same 
twice? And he goes, no, no, never. <laughs> it's like <laughs> Tony to be his backup. And uh, so, yeah, so then uh, we, 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 we gave it a go and we brought in Tony Mangurian from New York and, and he got about a minute playing into it and then till Bob stopped it and said, it's not working. And so we ended up going with the ragdoll version of can't wait. And so, and uh, yeah, it was a uh, pretty pr crazy because that was, you know, when, when we, when Bob walked in the studio and heard dancing and, and his making his voice sound funny and stuff, um, Bob got kind of pissed off. He was like, so he grabs this acoustic guitar and Dan's standing right in front of him and he picks it up. And Bob's got like these golf gloves on for whatever reason. And so he grabs the neck of the guitar and the body is over here. And he was like swinging it like this, just at Dan's head. And like, I, I thought, go ahead, hit him, hit him. Because <laughs> <laughs> as Dan smashed the dober on him, I thought, well, if he smashes on Dan's head, this would be better. <laughs> oh my God. So that's kind of like put a halt to Dan being around in the studio. And then it just became me and Bob. Dan decided he'd get out of the way and let this, uh, everything settle and stuff like that. So he, he kind of took, a, as he went into another studio and, you know, was trying to do some mixes on some other songs, but. Yeah, so it was just me and Bob there for a while. I talked to Kim Mitchell a couple of years ago, and I said, um, the last time I talked to him, I said, who, who's your favorite Canadian performer? And he, like, it came out Ian Thornley. He said, really? I can play guitar. He said, I, got, uh, I can play guitar like nobody's business. And I know you did Secrets. But what was that yeah. experience like? And how far back did you go back with him? Uh, um, I had no idea what um, his band was, you know, uh, Ian Thornley. Big yeah. yeah, big and I, I, you know, I lived in Los Angeles. I didn't know what they sounded like, and I never heard of them before. And and so uh, it was it was pretty cool. I met with him, and we got along great. And I told him, you know, how we we could do some things, and he he was right into it. He was, you know, really he loved a lot of records that I had made, and so he wanted to explore that world. And so uh, once we, I rented, I uh, didn't rent it. I used my sister's cottage up in. Uh, Halliburton it's on a lake it's private and so everybody lived in that in this cottage and I set up the rig and we worked in it was a big a-frame overlooking cranberry lake or whatever it's called and uh so yeah so and you know he's yeah he's an amazing guitar player and so every time he started playing I'd be hey uh hey Ian can you play like half of that that's that's like you know like you know and so it's like <laughs> You know, he's, 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 I had no idea he was that guy. And so I made him play like, you know, more melodically, you know, and I think that he, he liked that to, to get away from what he's normally doing and be more melodic and play more melody than, you know, and so it wasn't until years later that I figured out he was this amazing guitar player that plays like that. Yeah, so, yeah. So, but yeah, we hit it off great. And uh, I think I made a real beautiful record with him. Three days before a full moon. What's the deal with Neil Young? Like what, what why does he do that? Like what's going on there? And why, did, and that's why it took so long to record, right? Yeah. Well, this kind of like, you know, the, the tide, the pushing and the pulling of the tides of during a full moon. And uh, he claims if you're going to be creative, you're going to be creative between that time three days before the full moon and so he would only record on three days before the full moon so we would have to uh we he'd come in and then we'd do maybe two or three songs uh, in those three days and then we'd wait for the next month for the next full moon and he'd come back in again and so it was supposed to be an acoustic record and what it was is um dan formed a band called uh black dub and we ha he had this idea that we would film every take live and make a film out of it. And so we ha that was the uh, cinematographer um, that came in to shoot it. And so Dan and Neil at that time had uh, uh, the same manager, Elliot Roberts. And Elliot had showed uh, Neil like some of these little clips because they were all done in black and white. They were beautifully done. And so... Um, he goes, I want to do that too, Neil said. And so they made arrangements for Neil to show up. And so it was just going to be an acoustic record, him sitting in the parlor playing a record, uh, playing his acoustic. And, you know, he's got uh, what's called Hank, which is Hank Williams' old acoustic guitar. And, and, you know, he's got beautiful instruments and stuff like that. And so, um, 
you know, we started off with some beautiful acoustic songs. We, you know, we hand picked certain pickups and microphones and, and just made it sound cool. But, you uh, know, one day he was, he was playing the acoustic and I had dialed in the sound because I thought, Neil Young, how am I ever going to better his guitar's tone? You know, like, man, he's the master. And so I had accidentally kind of turned um, one of these um, effects boxes on it. And it was a subsonic harmonizer. And so when he hit that low note on the acoustic, it was like, it's like having a bass synthesizer playing along with it. And he really loved it because the sub, I had like these 18 inch sub woofers and part of my rig and it would just make his pant legs move every time he hit that low note it was so beautiful and so uh so he goes oh i want to try this next song on a, on my electric and he had this uh 1950s gold top les paul that he had painted black changed the back pickup to a um, thunderbird pickup it's a big kind of like a real uh, loud pickup so that was his sound and then he would run it into these two little tweed amps i got got behind me and so I thought, well, there's the sound. That's that's how he gets it. And it's like certain. But then when I brought the speakers up and turned the speakers up, that sub uh, uh, harmonizer box that I had was still on his guitar channel. And it made his electric big like thunder. And it was like super loud. All the windows in the house shook, you know, like his like big smile on his face. Like, wow, this is like fun. <laughs> you know, so he, yeah, so it was like awesome. OK, we got a new sound for it. And so that became part of the the, the acoustic sound. And then uh, for the, these electric numbers that we did, a hot hitchhiker and walk with me and stuff like that. Is that why um, he wanted you to go on tour with him? He wanted to, he wanted to replicate yeah. that, right? Yeah, he w didn't know how to explain it to his sound guy. And he said, can you come out with me and make sure that, you know, we get the sound live, you know? So he rented the will turn out and I told the live guy to get these certain effects boxes that I was using and stuff like that. And so I set it up and we're at the wheel turn and they only had two subs aside. And uh, I, I told him, I said, that's not going to work for me. I, and the live guy goes, why not? It's an acoustic show. I go, I need 16 subs aside. <laughs> he goes, what? I go, I need 16 subs aside here tomorrow. <laughs> He's like, there's not going to happen. And next day I walk in, I had 16 subs. <laughs> and uh, and so on stage, and he hit that live. It just shook the house. It was like powerful. And, and the way he plays, it, it just sounded like a band, you know, like the thunder of this thing. And, and so he doesn't usually use monitors. He just listens to the house. So he could feel that sub in his chest and the power he was getting it out of the guitar that he didn't ever get before. And so this was like something new for him. And so he was really excited about the sound. And he said, Mark, can, I want you to come out with me and teach my live guy, you know, who's been with him since 1970. He's a really nice guy, but, you know, he, he, all the shows I'd ever seen of Neil sounded amazing. And so it was this guy who was mixing it, but then he didn't really have the grip on on what all this new stuff was and stuff. So I went in and I did maybe like five or six shows and and I jumped off the bus in Buffalo and I came back to Hamilton. And so just as soon as I got back to Hamilton, um, my phone rings and, and it's Neil. And he said, he don't got it. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, our sound guy, he's, it didn't happen. And like the magic wasn't there. And I said, oh man, and I showed him how to do it. And he goes, you got to get back out here. And so he sends a car for me, Learjet, and ships me, and we land. I land in um, Syracuse or somewhere like that for the next show, and I go in there, and then poof, there's the sound back, and I go back. I, so after the show, I go to see Neil on his bus. He's got this really wicked kind of like customized eagle bus, and it's like a, and it's got two Cadillacs welded to the roof as sunlight sunroofs, and it's like it's really really sharp machine. And the whole inside is all kind of knotted pine, kind of twisted around. And the wall kind of comes out and then goes into a Wurlitzer and then goes back into the knotted pine. It's like really beautifully, tastefully done. And so I go back uh, to his bus after the show to, to see, uh, say, did you feel it? He goes, yeah, I felt it. Good, thanks. It was, it was really good. And uh, at the same time, uh, he had, uh, he claims that the only fish you can eat is this wild Alaskan salmon because it's not... It's not uh, contaminated yet. And so he would fly in every day wild Alaskan salmon from Alaska. And then 
on a private jet who would stop in um, Oregon to pick up some organic blueberries. And so he had that set up uh, on his counter on the bus. And so we were chatting and he gets up and then he looks over and he sees that somebody had put plastic wrap over top of the blueberries and the fish. He goes, who the fuck now put that on my fish? I just went off by, you know, I was paying $50,000 to have this fish flown in every day. And then once he calmed down, I go, that was a little uh, over the top. He goes, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. It's like, oh my God. He's got a, he wanted to fire the chef. <laughs> so, yeah, so. For you, what, what is it? Uh, I mean, there's so many different angles you can come at Neil Young at as far as, no, not politics. Well, we, we never talk politics on my channel. No. But there's so many different angles. Like, there's so many things that make him great. To you personally, what is it that makes him Neil Young? What What is it that? It's, it's He's two different characters to me. Like, uh, like studio, he's, you know, all buddy-buddy and it's nice. But live, he has a persona live where it's like his crew or everybody's nervous around him. And so, you know, like it was it was kind of bizarre to see, you know, like having these two two different people come out of him, you know, like live, he's very demanding and this and that. And, you know, people are afraid to be around. And he had the problem with the piano where the, the foot um, pedal was, was loose and it was moving around. Everybody was afraid to touch the piano. I, I just rolled under there, got a piece of wood with a hammer, bang, 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 knocked it in. It's like, right now he's nice and solid. <laughs> and so it's like, because, you know, we were hanging out and talking, you know, I'm a car lover too. And, so I collect cars and stuff like that. And and so he loves any cars from the 50s. And, you know, he came uh, to the studio in like a 50s El Dorado. And, you know, it was really beautiful. And so we were always like looking together yeah, for cars and stuff like that. So we had our little car club <laughs> in our own little way. But, yeah, he, he, he's in the studio. He is uh, he doesn't like to overdub. He wants it to be natural off the floor um and that way and uh and i think that's for him it works you know it's like that's that's the way he's going to do it he won't do it twice the same or anything like that um but yeah it, it's uh he's he's an amazing lyricist in a way where you know we're waiting for the next full moon and dan would call him up and he'd say you having any luck writing any songs and and neil would say to him uh well, I'm sitting here over the rabbit hole and nothing's coming out. And, and uh, so, uh, so that was kind of crazy. And so he comes back the next full moon and he goes, I wrote this song on this weed. I smoked this weed and I wrote the song. And I go, he goes, I want, I wanted to record the, uh, the song on the same joint. So he put out the joint, only had half left. So when he came back into the studio, he would smoke the other half. So he wrote it on this joint and he recorded it on this joint. You know, it's like it was pretty, pretty nutty. whatever works. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, you know, he, he had just had that brain aneurysm and his doctors had told him not to smoke and do that. And, you know, he caught me in the kitchen one night and I was like, after the, after we were done, you know, I, I don't smoke whenever, whenever I work, I just, at the end of the night, I'll have a little pup. And he caught me and, and he said, do you want some? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> so I caught him smoking pup. I can't. <laughs> it's kind of fucked up. Well, Robert Plant told you something, which is one of the many reasons I think uh, he won't do Led Zeppelin. But when you met him, he says he he can't sing high anymore. Yeah, he was. He well, you know, like this whole raising sand. He's singing down low, and he, he's got that lower type of uh, tone. These well, as you get old, it just happens, right? And so I was pushing him to sing up high, and he goes, "I can't hit those notes anymore." And so, uh, um, so we had, I had this one loop that we, I played that had this really cool, it was Brian Blade, this uh, jazz drummer from New Orleans that I made a loop of. And then um, it had this kind of really crazy, cool groove against it. And so he would sing and Dan would play like this electric guitar and it was like really heavy. And he, and he would go up there and I go, I'm like, yes, hi, hi, hi. And so he was up there in that Led Zeppelin range and it was amazing. So we had cut five songs. We did a couple of low ones, but then there's like two tracks that are just like, he's hitting those notes and it sounds just like Led Zeppelin. It's pretty, I was pretty amazed. Well, for you being a Zeppelin fan, I mean, for you, and you'd mentioned this before that uh, you didn't want to like, oh, remember that time? Like I said a while yeah. ago, but if you could have asked him anything, did you get a chance to ask that or what would it have been if you could? 
You know what? The thing that I, I notice about a lot of these artists, you know, from Joni Mitchell to Bob and and uh, and Neil, uh, the thing is, is, they like to talk about the past and they like to tell their story. And, you know, Robert would just go on on rampages, just, you know, going on about Bonham. They they were here in L.A. And, and then suddenly, you know, Bonham's at the whiskey and it's like he's yelling at the drummer. You sock and you know, he just he's drunk and all, all this shit and he's so he and he goes you know what that spinal tap movie you know where they're lost under the stage because that really happened that was us we were lost we couldn't find our way to the stage and so he had all the stories of the led zeppelin so i didn't need to ask and so he was just giving it out you know as as you know they would come and go like in between but uh recording and stuff but yeah so it was amazing to hear coming out of his mouth you know because you know you hear the tales and stuff of what they were doing and and so yeah so it was incredible stories that he he would go on about and he you know he didn't he didn't um his son had died during this tour that they were doing and he was in los angeles and he got the news and so they canceled the rest of the tour and he went back home and, uh, and, you know, he said, nobody came to visit me except for Bonham. John Bonham was the only guy that came to visit me to see how I was. And the other guys, they, I never got a phone call from them and, and it was kind of odd. And so he just had, he, there it was just like, after that, there was like a, I think he just kind of pushed them aside and just, you know, cause they weren't there for him when he needed his son had died, you know, and you need, you need some kind of like, you know, somebody to come and check on you and stuff like that. And yeah. And I think that he, uh, he just didn't want to reform without Bonham because uh, Bonham was his best friend. And, you know, that's the sound that they make. And even his son that he's a great drummer, but it's, it's just not the same. So. When people get in a room with you and they know who you are, if they get who you are, like the musicologists, the, you know, the people who know music, people who read the liner notes, they all of course are very familiar with your work. But what do people ask you about the most? Um, well, number one is always Bob Dylan. Uh, that's 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 you know forgiven. But um, uh, you know, I I tell these tales while I'm making records too. So <laughs> and so that's how Listen Up uh, the book happened because I I tell all these stories and and one guy in New Orleans, uh, um, uh, my friend Mik Misha, he owns a studio there and he goes, you got to do a book with all these stories. These are, you, you got, somebody has got to put this out. And it was like, I said, Oh yeah, sure. Or whatever. And so while I was got cancer, I started to write it all down. And so it was, it started off as we need a biography from you or some kind of like, you know, uh, discography. And so I started writing it down, you know, starting in Hamilton and how I kind of got the job there. And then suddenly boom, you know, I had a motorcycle accident and I got the job at the studio and then that met Dan and then, the new orleans period with how all that stuff all rolled out so yeah so you know, it's pretty um story time is is a part of what i do also so i i tell these stories to the musicians and yeah and sure a lot of them they want to know like what's iggy pop like and you know they all have their heroes like working with you too i just finished making a record with iggy pop and uh bon is like play that track again i want to hear that because that's their hero, the Oegi Pop. And it's like, so they're taunting me to like, and, and then Edge is like, oh, I really love that song, Argentina, Miss Argentina. And I play that one for him. And, and so they were like little kids listening to the, their heroes. It was pretty funny to watch. But you mentioned about uh, Neil Young being the different, there's this different size, but you had said that Iggy Pop, what was his real name? Uh, Iggy Pop, for, his real name is Jim Osterberg. Yeah, so. so I call him Jim sometimes. So very, very, uh, very different on stage. I mean, he's the best performer, by the way. When he was opening for the Pretenders, uh, I saw him, I think, in Vancouver or Edmonton. Uh, he's the best performer I've ever seen in my life. Oh, yeah. And he's still like that. And he's 70-odd years old. It's pretty incredible. And he still hops around the stage like that. It's uh, it's pretty crazy. So, but he got um, off stage. Yeah. It was that story. You said you, you got off. He got off stage. And for whatever reason, because he's he's got this... Jekyll he built Hunt. himself up yeah it's like like 30 minutes before the show he doesn't see anybody he winds himself up into Iggy Pop and then after the show it takes him 30 minutes to wind back down and so I'd be backstage and I'd say hey hey Jim or hey Iggy and he, he like 
looks at you like you don't know who you are. And then half an hour later, he goes, Mark, what are you doing here? I didn't see you. <laughs> it's like, I, I talked to you earlier. Yeah. So he like, it, it's, he gets, uh, builds himself up into this kind of character kind of thing. It was, it's, it's pretty crazy. What's he like in the studio though? He's a very intellectual and he, I regard him as good as a writer as Dylan, because he, he can do, would do three takes in a row and he can do right off the cuff out of the, out of his head, with nothing on on paper, uh, exactly uh, the same type of uh, um, rhythm of the, the uh, of the lyrics, but different, completely different lyrics on each take. And each take sounded you had to like pick which is the best one. You know, like it was it was hard to, to like I like that verse, but I like this one here and and, and that. So it's uh, it's it's I never seen anybody do it like that. I never seen anybody completely different kind of words you know he seems like an interesting guy just uh yeah yeah and he's really intellectual and smart and he he likes you know he likes to have his uh we he does like to work in the daytime he's got a he, oh yeah he's got a, a rule also he's got a 12 hour rule and we're not allowed to go into the studio unless it's 12 hours if we if we finish at midnight we can't go in the studio until noon the next day and so he at, at, in New Orleans, where I was making the first record, he'd come down the stairs and I'd be in the studio getting ready for the day. And he goes, out, get out of the studio. You're not allowed in the studio. Nobody's allowed in the studio until the 12 hour rule is up. And so so I, I think that's just a kind of like a clearing of the palate, you know, to make sure that, you know, you're not wear yourselves out. <laughs> so it's uh, pretty funny. You've touched on something with Joni Mitchell where uh, I remember talking to Chris Bodie. I was introducing him on stage and I'd inter uh, inter uh, interviewed him that day. And, he, you know, you worked with Sting. And I said, well, what was it like? I said, I bet you when you worked with, with Joni Mitchell, I said, I bet you she was describing everything artistically. I said, listen, pardon my ignorance. I was never there. I've never been in the room with the lady. But there's she just talks like a painter all the time. And. And he says, oh, and then he went on and on. And you, you've touched on that. Well, what was your experience like with Joni? Well, um, I had met her originally uh, on a, a Brian Blade had a jazz record and he invited her into the studio to sing on one of the tracks. So I kind of knew her from, from that record. And then um, who's that guy from Canada got arrested the interviewer guy, John. Oh, uh, uh, Gameshi. G Gameshi uh, Gion, yeah. Gion Gameshi. Yeah. So, um, Gion or I forget. yeah, yeah. Uh, so he had gotten an interview with her and I got a phone call from the, the producer doing that show. And he said, we want to have an all Canadian crew. Would you come in and record her? And I said, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, and so when I went to, uh, do that, I, we did it at her house. She doesn't like to leave her house. So, uh, so I said, Hey, Joni, you remember? Oh yeah. I want you, I want you to do some stuff with me. And it's like, I, I said, okay. And so that was kind of the invitation to kind of coming up to her house and recording. You know, she, she had her very first record, um, uh, seagulls, or I can't remember what it's called songs for a seagull or yeah. something like that. And so she goes, uh, David Crosby had uh, produced my first record. And uh, she goes, as I say, he misproduced my record. <laughs> and so, uh, so all of her first kind of four records were just really just her acoustic guitar and voice. And so, but on that first record, um, Crosby made her double her guitar parts. So there was two guitars and she never liked that. She always wanted to be pure. And, and so she said, will you remix that record for me? I said, yeah, sure, no problem. So I had to find the masters, which was a, a, a job in itself, going around. And luckily, found some guy that was doing transfers uh, that, uh, for um, Cosmic Steel, Nash and Young. So her first record was done in the middle of one of their records. So the, all of her takes are on the same reels that Cosby Steel's Nash is on. And so uh, I went to Santa Monica and picked them up from this guy. And so all the tapes were what's called shedding because they're so old. You have to have them baked. Baked. Yeah. Hey, I've got it. I've got a studer right there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Look at that. SDA 80 or thing. I think it's called. Yeah, yeah. 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 So all the old tapes needed to be baked, but there was a four track. What was done on uh, asphalt, uh, asphalt or some kind of different kind of like more like a film type stuff that didn't need to be baked, but the, um, 
the other stuff did. So once I did that, I transferred it to uh, uh, this machine I got over here called the Radar. And it's a Canadian digital, like a tape recorder. It's like a 24 track tape recorder. So I had that on, it's portable. I can go anywhere in the world. And so um, so I went up to her house and I started mixing it. And and uh, she would, I'd give her the mixes and she would go into her bedroom and she would listen to the mixes off the TV, off her TV. And she goes, it sounds better off the Dolby system than it does on the surround system. And and I'm like, oh, that's your reference. Oh my God. And so it was kind of crazy to have her, uh, you know, listening on off of her TV. Maybe it's a good reference, but so yeah. Well, you so know, once 10 CC, uh, quickly, I, you probably heard the story 10 CC, I'm not in love. The, yeah. to, to make sure it sounded good, they actually played it through a transistor radio. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Well, we, we, they had that at Grand Avenue where they had a FM uh, transmitter and you go out into your car and you can tune it to that channel and you could listen to your mixes in the car, which was a, a pretty cool idea because that's, you know, a lot of people listen in their car. But yeah, so, but she was, she considered, uh, Joni considers herself as an artist more than a musician. And so she's got beautiful paintings on her wall. And so if she's in my book, you'll see some of those paintings hanging on our wall. And so, yeah, so she is just, you know, like I'm working with her and Brian Blade and, and she's just chain smoking. And so we do a take and then she just starts talking. And I look at the watch and she's been talking for an hour nonstop. You can't get a word in. She, she's going on about, you know, Larry, he took all my records. I don't have any records. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. And so she's a sweet, sweetest old lady. And I couldn't believe because she's old and she's a bit fragile. But she was living in that house by herself up there in Bel Air. And, and I always thought she had the maid come in, but it was, there was nobody else there to kind of take care of her. And, I thought, what well, if she tripped on her dog and that, what would happen? So she had that brain aneurysm and then boom, you know, like, so I, I'd finished mixing that thing and she had that aneurysm. And then I never heard from her for a while after that. Uh, but she, she recovered. And it's weird that, that Neil had the same brain aneurysm, you know, well, at, right after, uh, uh, before we made um, that record, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of crazy that they both had it. She had mentioned that uh, I remember that she said that uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young kind of abandoned her. She says when she got to L.A. Yeah, there was a, a feeling of an aban uh, uh, abandonment uh, because yeah, she just felt she was very alone, and so she was just trying to you know she was young and just comes you know they invited her there and then just she, she maybe felt a little bit out out of their circle or something like that. A tragically hip. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. Uh, they like to party those boys. <laughs> I like the fact that you tell the story that, well, first of all, you don't do four takes of a song. You do the whole album and then you do the whole album again. So what was it like working with them? Uh, they're great guys. You know, we're all, we're all great buddies and yeah, they, they, they like to party. And, you know, it's like, you know, you figure there's people that can hold their liquor and then there's people that can't. And those guys can hold their liquor. They would 24 beers a day each, you know. Yeah, the, but that says something. Yeah, if you can hold your liquor, that says something too. Yeah, yeah. And, and so that, you know, like I'd have one beer, I'd be loaded. And so, and they like to smoke pot. And so they smoke a quarter pound of pot a week. And it's just, uh, it's, it's pretty crazy. And to, and to keep focus, you know. And so back, uh, back to that dietary thing that we're talking about, you know, we would be eating pizzas and pasta and stuff like that and i wasn't getting any takes like for the first two weeks of making that record i didn't have one take under my belt and i got scared and i was like jesus like are we ever going to get a take you know because they they it's not like you do three takes in a row you can kind of build it up and get it right and it's, they're just doing a full set of all the song like they would do live to capture this this thing they wanted to get and so it wasn't working and and i i gone to Daniel M. I said, look, I know I'm kind of in the trenches here and I'm getting a little worried. And I said, you know, you go through this with you too all the time. Like, what do you, what do, what do you do? He goes, he says, you got to get up early, go in there, find all the best bits and cut it together. He said, that's, that's what you're going to have to do. And you so did that I did for it. day for night. Did that for day for night. Yeah. And so I, I went in, in the early in the morning and, and um, I, cut the best parts of all the, all the, the, the takes from that day. And then I, the guys would come in at a noon and I say, this is the last take we did from last night. They go, Oh, well, that's great. Let's use that one. And, and so not all the record was done like that, but there, there was some that, you know, started that way. Uh, 
so yeah but that's it's it's still a performance it's just different things put together you know but so, Gord Downey uh, Gord Downey told you later he knew what you were doing though right yeah he well because he's the lyricist and he was changing the lyrics so he knew exactly what what take had certain lyrics on it and so he goes I know what you're doing <laughs> like, oh, shit. I said yeah I'll, I just got a little worried and so but he was cool with it and so that was that was great you know that's your biggest selling album I heard that um you know I when I made that record uh they were signing to MCA and I remember going to uh to the office there in Hollywood and meeting with all the big executives and they go this is terrible this is the worst record they've ever made like how could you we can't put this out you know this is like no it doesn't sound like any of their other records like you know it's like and they were they stood up for it they said we're putting this thing out we like it and this is what we want and you know and i thought that was it for that record and i you know retreated to la <laughs> to you know with my family and stuff but uh it was kind of funny you know to hear that you know years later how how, how big of an impact that record had on a lot of people and how it was their favorite record and so that was you know fulfilling later in life for me you know uh, learning that and then you know hearing that it was their best-selling record you know when mca said it would never sell anything and it was the worst thing they ever done <laughs> so that's one of the greatest canadian records that, right yeah there. And, yeah and so that goes to show what uh what labels are like you know um i had a, another story um from uh, uh radiohead they had put out this record they made this record called okay computer and they took it to capital and their a and r guy was this guy perry watts russell an english a and r guy and uh so they give it to him he listened to it and he wrote him like this five page letter saying if you put this out it's career suicide you're gonna ruin your career this is crap you know and they stood up for themselves they put it out and became one of their biggest records too so you know like these labor label executives they you know if they don't hear what the the next pop song is or whatever they just they shoot it down, you know, like you don't have a single, you don't have this, they can't work. Else. But that's the thing about big record companies. They need something to sell. So I think that they got worried about the uh, day for night that they wouldn't be able to get a single out of it and, and make it work, you know? And so, but it's, it came more of an album than a single kind of world. They did make singles, Greasy Jungle and, and uh, one other one, I think they, they used the singles, but um, yeah, it just became a big, cult record in a way you know like every fan loved that record it was, it was so that was good to hear late years later you know i remember uh, right after 9 11 i talked to tony levin and and uh, I, I and he had told me he says my god my wife was downtown in new york when this all happened and uh i asked him, when's the next peter gabriel album coming out he says oh we never really know but we just wait and we do other things yeah, I talked to Jerry Murata about talk, working with him. You you worked with uh, Gabriel when Manu Caché was his drummer, I think, later on, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I, I didn't do so, but I did Us. Yes. Some what of was us. that like? Uh, it was, uh, I. they came to New Orleans, Peter came to New Orleans, and uh, I think uh, I recorded a bunch of horns and a bunch of other stuff on it, and and um, and then they kind of went, and then, you know, it, it, those kind of records last a year or longer, you know, like, they, they, so they come and go same with you too like the uh, all that you can't leave behind record i was there in the beginning then they went away and then i was there in the middle and then uh, they went away and i was there at the end mixing so it was uh but some like on that record it was like oh it was two years three people had died and four babies were born and you know people coming it's like it's just like a are big, you talking gabriel or you too you too yeah, okay. yeah. and uh, so but bono was infatuated with the uh, hip-hop so a lot of the songs, like there were seeds in the beginning and then the, the middle period, they came in and everything was programmed like with hip hop beats and stuff like that. And so they took that to, uh, I remember going with them to uh, to Interscope and Jimmy Iovine was their A&R guy. And Jimmy's like this little tiny Jewish guy from New York. He's, he's pretty incredible. And so uh, he listens to it and he goes, this is amazing. It's, it's incredible. This is the best thing I've ever heard. But where the hell is you too? Hello, I don't hear you too. Hello, where are they? Get back in there and give me some you too. <laughs> so I went back in there and Larry put drums and Adam played his bass. And so that was the uh, kind of uh, how 
all that you can't leave behind came about. And, you know, so it was, it's crazy. It happens to stages and it's like peaks and valleys, you know, you hit a peak, great. And then you end up in a valley and, you know, and, you know, you two stories go crazy. So Avril Levine, I have two of my colleagues who interviewed her and they said, you know, she's fun to interview. She's a little bratty. She's fun to interview though. What was your experience like with Avril? Well, she was 16 or 15 or she was really young. And so I got a call from my management um, that this, uh, her production team had um, all program drums and bass, uh, all kinds of, uh, um, on the record and they wanted real drums. So they wanted me to record uh, her first three hit songs, Complicated, uh, Skater Boy, and then one other one, I can't remember. So she came in with that production team. And uh, so I brought my friend who's a really amazing drummer, Victor Andruzzo, and uh, he played the drums and uh, we had a different bass player. I never knew who he was, but um, but yeah, so I re recorded all, and she was just shy. She would just sit there in the chair. And, so, but she did some vocals and stuff like that. It's, it, that sounded great. And so, so, but I, you know, I didn't know who she was or, you know, she was just some little girl trying to make a record and with this thing. You know, next thing you know, like she's the biggest thing since sliced cheese, you know. So, <laughs> and so it was kind of cool. And so we hit it off. And I recently just saw her, I guess, at the last Junos. And I said, do you remember me? I, you know, that big, huge you know, villa in Hollywood. She goes, oh, that was you. I said, yeah. And so it was uh, her, her um, it was it was good. And she remembered who I was. But then I was quickly uh, detained by her security. People. That's enough. Get out. You come on out. I was like, but I know I <laughs> <He pulled me. laughs> but yeah sometimes you have and i find this when i interview people because in my case when i interview someone who's younger uh they don't say they're always saying when's the interview coming up because sometimes i mean yours won't take long to but, but anyway they're going oh when's the interview coming up and they'll drive me freaking crazy they'll go my fans are waiting and then i'll put the interview up and i you know because yeah. our interviews do really well but yeah they'll get like 25 hits because they're fans hit, but that's okay. Cause they're young and they're starting off and I understand, but they drive me crazy. But you had said like people like Mumford and sons uh, who were maybe fighting a little bit amongst themselves, but sometimes it's the younger groups that are different, more difficult, right? Yeah. A lot more difficult because they all want to sound like so-and-so. And so I'm about making new sounds and creating uh, a sound for them. And they, but we want to sound like this record or whatever. And, and so I met them in, in Los Angeles here. They played a club, uh, Hotel Cafe. Them with three other bands, they're all touring together. And so I met them outside in the alley. And so, you know, their whole thing is, what was it like with Dylan? You know, like, and so they were excited. And then they said, will you come work with us in England? And it was just before Christmas. So I said, yeah, they, they didn't have any money. They didn't have a record deal. They didn't have anything. So I went and uh, they managed to find somebody to give them some money and so I flew to flew to England. And we worked at um, um, Metropolis Studio, and it was a cool place. And so I had come up with this technique where I was using like an eight oh eight kick drum as there, because he's usually got like a kick drum on stage that he just kind of, you know, it's four on the floor type four thing. But floor, I, yeah. I switched it to an electronic one. And it sounded really killer, and and I kind of rearranged some of their songs, and, and they were you know yelling at each other and like they can't do that. Oh no, I'm gonna do whatever. You know, they're like little little children. And uh, so uh, I recorded it there and then I had to mix it. And so uh, I just thought I was there just, you know, trying, you know, the deal was, is if uh, they got a deal, they'd hire me as a producer. And so I said, yeah, sure. And so I, I didn't get paid. I just went there to kind of like work on that with them. And then when, once I got there and after I recorded everything, they wanted me to mix it. And so we went to uh, um, uh, Olympic. Yeah, it was Olympic Studios. And so I get there and you two's upstairs in the studio and I'm downstairs mixing them. So on a break, I go upstairs and there's, you know, Eno and Bono, Dan wasn't there. And so I, the, the guitar tech um, took me in there and said, Mark's here. And oh, hey, hey, Mark. And, and they go, where's Dan? And Daniel. And I said, um, I think he's in Jamaica. Well, that's a good place for him. <laughs> he, was, he wasn't there, finished the record with him. He's in Jamaica. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, so that was kind of funny. And uh, yeah, so it ended up, I was, I didn't know, but that was an EP they made. And so they were selling that EP and they got signed from it. 
And uh, they never, they said the record company didn't want to have me. They wanted to pick the producer. And so they picked the producer that did these bright eyes records and stuff like that. So I got, you know, I got them the deal with this EP and fired, you know, out of the deal of, for producing their records. And they, they came out of the box pretty big too, you know, yeah. like next thing, you know, the biggest thing. Canadian Chris, what was Christmas like for you growing up? Any great albums you got for Christmas? Any kind of any any anecdotal Christmas story you want to give me? Canadian Christmas story. Canadian Christmas. Well, yeah, it was a snowy Christmas up there in the Canada. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I think uh, my first record was um, Sunny and Cher. That was that's uh, I for you know I was a little kid you know I didn't know. And so, yeah, that was I. That's the first record I got. But my brother and sister are like ten years older than me, so I would end up listening to, you know, what they were listening to. And so it was like, you know, my teenage years became like Led Zeppelin and the Stones. But they were in a different generation ten years before me, and they were listening to like Johnny Winders and uh, um, uh, who else? What are the records? Uh, they you let me come out at night. Out. Yeah, yeah. So it was all all that stuff and. You know, and then, um, but I think, uh, yeah, so Frankenstein, you remember that that track? That's the so, album. That was their period. And so, but I grew up with that also. So, so that was kind of cool. And I got to listen to all those great records that they had. But then as a teenager, then it shifted to, the, you know, the Stooges and then um, uh, with Iggy and then uh, Led Zeppelin, The Who, all, all the killer, you know, rock bands and so that's i'm more of a rock kind of kid that grew up and through that rock and how do they react sorry sorry i gotta interrupt yeah. here because this yeah. you mentioned them how do they react to your six i mean your success like this is um i mean i know it's you but every yeah. every artist i mean you're a fan too and everyone has a little bit of oh it's just a little old me but how yeah. did your family react to everything you've done that's funny because it's uh they didn't really react, <laughs> you know, my dad was like, uh, I think he was proud, but like in the beginning, you know, I was working this club on lock street and it was a punk rock night. And I didn't know that. And I said, come down and see what I do, dad. And uh, so he shows up and it's punk rock night and the guy's on stage and cutting his stuff with beer balls. And my dad sees him in the toilet and says, what are you doing that from mate? You, 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 you're mad and all this stuff. And so he goes, I don't think this is the right career for you. You need to get a, proper job you know like become become a, a welder something that you can lay back on and then years later i just got you know grammy things hanging on his walls and stuff like that but uh yeah i think you know i think they they do um uh my dad was like a a, a um champion boxer from england and so he's uh whether uh, uh what is it called uh walter weight or something like that and so he's got trophies and you know he's like the top guy there as a boxer and so his family he was always like the star of the family and so he there was a lot of like you know praise to that but when I kind of did my thing you know there's oh that's nice you know well you want to come to see the hit tra tragically hip or whatever okay yeah and it's like it was that's nice it's just like they would never give me any like props or for, or treat me any different you know i'm just like the the youngest of the family and oh well you did well that's nice yeah you know how okay. common that is you know how how often in 40 years of interviewers i mean you know those are all autographed albums nothing compared to what you've done but i'll tell you through talking to people i'd say half the artists i talk to and it's kind of sad to me uh, they'll say, well, my, my brother's never said anything about Mike. He never asked me a question or, no. or it's just a weird thing of going, yeah, but it's kind of a, I mean, you don't, I know you don't think you're better than them, but it's yeah. kind of a big deal. I mean, it's, yeah, I, you know, you're looking for the, the, the attention of, of that, but they won't give it to you. You know, it's like, you're just still my little brother and you know, whatever. <laughs> it was like yeah. my sister, you know, like put out, well, that's a good book. Yeah. It's okay. You know, like just, <laughs> it's just a book well just a book. you know whatever <laughs> so i would like to add this is my new book and i would like everybody to look buy this book and this is a great uh, coffee table book it's got beautiful pictures black and whites and this is all the icons i work with and i want you guys to have this book and buy it and then in the meantime 
this is my first book. Listen up. And if you want uh, this, if you get this book, read this book, and then you buy this book, you can see everything I've described in this book about. And this is all the beautiful places that were made the records with all those beautiful icons. Links to both of Mark Howard's books are in the description where you can pick them up. One is the storybook, basically telling the stories about working with all the greats, Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, Bob Dylan, Tom Waits, Tragically Hip, and so many more. So we'll have links to both books. Like I said, the first one's the storybook. The second one is basically the pictures book. We've showed you some pictures in the videos. Links to that and a lot more. If you want to help the channel, there are links. Subscribe. Check out our podcast. It's a fairly new podcast. It's doing really, really well. And you can hear a lot of our full interviews on our podcast. Share our videos and podcasts and like, comment. We'd appreciate that. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music. Take care of yourself. Thank you.